Hello, my name is Jeremy Petrovich, a developmental editor for Current Protocols at Wiley. It is our pleasure today to present Dr. Slavomir S. Piatek. Dr. Piatek has been measuring proper motions of nearby galaxies using images obtained with the Hubble Space Telescope as a senior university lecturer of physics at New Jersey Institute of Technology. He has developed a photonics training program for engineers at Hamamatsu Corporation in New Jersey in the role of a science consultant. Also at Hamamatsu, he is involved in popularizing a SIPM as a novel photo detector by writing and lecturing about it and by experimenting with the device. He earned a PhD in physics at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, in 1994. We are excited to have Dr. Piatek present to us today his webinar entitled Photo Detection in Flow Cytometry. With that, I give you Dr. Piatek. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for this very nice introduction. Uh, first, I would like to welcome everyone, wherever you are listening. Again, my name is Slavomir Piatek. I am a science consultant at Hamatsu Corporation and the university lecturer in physics uh, at New Jersey Institute of Technology. We are going to spend the next about 60 minutes or so uh, discussing photo detection in flow cytometry. This webinar is organized as follows. So first, there will be a brief introduction to uh, the flow cytometry. I'll discuss the uh, basic setup and detection. In the second part of the webinar, we'll talk briefly about photo detectors used in flow cytometry. In the third part, uh, I'll discuss photo detection, and we are going to finish with one slide summarizing and concluding this presentation. A modern flow cytometer consists of three fundamental basic elements. We have fluidics, we have optics, and electronics. A photo detector bridges the two last components, optics and electronics. The role of photo detector will be to convert light signal to electrical signal. The central component, perhaps heart of flow cytometer, is a flow cell, as shown in the slide. In the flow cell, we have a sheaf fluid flowing, shown in deep blue. Into that sheaf fluid, a different fluid with a cell suspended is injected. Due to hydramic, hydrodynamic focusing, the cells in the flow are organized in a file. At some point in the flow cell, there is a point known as interrogation point. When a cell passes that interrogation point, light from external laser illuminates the cell. Light scatters from the cell, and the scattered light carries information about the cell. In the modern flow cytometer, the sampling rate of the cells can vary from about 1,000 cells per second to, in some cases, even 100,000 cells. Uh, let's look at the basic setup of the optics. As mentioned already, we have a flow cell. On the side, uh, we have at least one, typically more lasers, that provide illumination of the cells. You may ask, why two lasers? Well, one, the role of one laser is to, as I said, illuminate the cells. However, other wavelengths may be necessary to excite fluorescence in the cells. The light interacts with the cell and undergoes various processes, which I'll describe shortly. Around the cell, we have two optical system sets. One is known as forward scatter, uh, which detects light, which is scattered by a relatively small angle in the forward detection. At around 90 degrees, uh, we have another setup uh, known as side scatter, uh, which scatters, which detects light scattered by larger angle. Uh, let's look more closely at the interrogation point. The interrogation point is defined by the light from a laser. In ideal situation, uh, when cell passes interrogation point, uh, the amount of light falling on a sensor on the cell will be independent of its location in the flow cell. For that to happen, we would like to have uh, light density in the interrogation point uh, uniform. Now, the output from a laser has a Gaussian profile uh, which means that light density is not uniform. And so what one does, one will use the, a cylindrical lens to stretch this uh, beam profile, typically to sizes about 100 by 20 uh, micrometers. That provides rather or flatter illumination profile. Typical uh, lasers uh, used in flow cytometry uh, have wavelengths 
for example, the very common one is 488 nanometers, 505, 514, etc. Uh, the modern flow cytometer is going to uh, use uh, a solid state laser, uh, which are less expensive as the older uh, ones, and then can provide uh, up to about 150 milliwatts of power. Let's now look at how light can interact uh, with a cell. So on this slide, we see light uh, from a laser coming from le left-hand side. A number of processes can take place. First, uh, light can uh, reflect from the cell, as shown. Another possibility is that light is going to diffract, as shown here. Another possibility is that light is going to pass through the cell and undergo refraction. Yet another possibility is that light is going to excite fluorescence. In this case, a light of different wavelengths will be emitted from a cell. Another possibility is that light is simply absorbed by the cell. What we see that in most of these processes, uh, there is a change in direction of the incoming light. That change in direction will depend on cell properties such as size, granularity, orientation, and other factors. The amount of light that is directed either in the side direction or forward direction will depend on these properties, and therefore measuring that light will tell us something about the cell property. Now, the light that interacts with the cell, the scattered light, is a signal. However, in addition to that signal light that carries information, we can have spurious light. This spurious light would carry, I guess one could say, misinformation. So here we see an uh, interrogation point. There are no cells passing. However, deflection of light is going to occur if, for example, there are impurities uh, in the sheath uh, fluid. Another possibility that we have changes in index of refraction. If there is a change, for example, here at the boundary, uh, light is going to be scattered from that boundary. Another possibility is that a turbulence develops in the flow. That turbulence, as shown here, uh, will also be a source of scattered light. Now, a question is, how much light do we get from a typical cell uh, from the interrogation point? If for a typical setup uh, where the interrogation point is a region about 20 by 100 micrometers, and if I use a 10 microcell uh, cell, the amount of light that one typically gets is about well, 5 times 10 to 12 photons per event. Please note that only a very tiny fraction of these photons available are going to be detected by our optical and electrical uh, system. Uh, let's uh, look briefly at autonomy of the, of the light signal. So on the left, we see a pulse of light coming from the cell. Let me just make a brief comment about, so the laser that we use is continuous wave. So it's not the pulsed wave, uh, uh, laser. However, we get pulses because when the cell is passing through the interrogation point, uh, light is scattered, right? but only when the cell is present in the interrogation point. And so we do get a pulses of light. So therefore, a pulse of light will be characterized by some duration and some uh, maximum intensity. So on the right-hand side, we see, a, a, say, a typical power as a function of time a distribution for, for a pulse. Now, this duration of the pulse is going to be on the order of few, let's say, 10 microseconds or, or so. Of course, that duration will depend on the size of the interrogation point and also on how fast the cells are flowing through the interrogation point. Uh, let's approximate uh, a pulse with a triangle. By doing so, one can find a simple relationship between the peak power in the pulse versus uh, as a function of number of photons uh, in the pulse and the pulse duration. And so using a wavelength of 488 nanometers and a 10 microsecond uh, pulse duration, uh, we see that the peak power as a function of number of photons in the lower part of the slide. Uh, more photons we can get, uh, more peak power uh, one has in the pulse. So let's now have a closer look at the forward scattered uh, optical system. So here is a flow cell, uh, which is being illuminated by uh, a laser. So light gets uh, scattered in all directions. So in the forward direction, we have some iris or aperture. Uh, 
that is going to allow light only within certain cone to pass through, which is collected by the lens and then focused on uh, the photo detector. Please note the beam blocker. Uh, the purpose of the beam blocker is to block the light that did not interact with the cell. Since we can have uh, multiple wavelengths present in the light signal, one is going to use a filter uh, which will filter out all unwanted wavelengths. The forward scatter uh, signal is uh, strongest or stronger than the side scatter. And typically here, we are going to uh, detect the wavelength that is used to illuminate the cell, i.e. not uh, the fluorescence wavelength. Again, for a, in a typical setup, uh, using again 488 nanometer laser and two micrometer cells and 20 nanowatt laser, we get about four microwatts of power, uh, peak power uh, in the forward scatter. This amount of power is large enough so one can use photo detectors such as photodiode and more about that uh, shortly. Let's now look at side scattered channel. So in this channel, light is uh, typically a mixture of illumination light and also fluorescence light. Uh, one can have one, two, three, or more fl fluorescent wavelengths. The light level is much lower than in forward scattered. And because the light level is much lower, typically we are going to use uh, photo detectors that have intrinsic gain. Traditionally, uh, PMT or photomultipliers photomultiplier tubes were used. However, these days uh, the choice uh, has expanded. Uh, one can use avalanche photodiode or silicon photomultiplier, as we'll discuss a little bit later today. So here we see a, a side scatter optical setup. So again, at the bottom, we have uh, a flow cell being illuminated. A light is scattered uh, in a sideway or 90 uh, degree direction. The different colors of arrows show uh, multiple wavelengths. Now, using dichroic mirrors, we would like to separate these um, wavelengths into separate channels. And so therefore, uh, one will use as many photo detectors as wavelengths of interest. Uh, in this particular cartoon version setup, uh, we have uh, three distinct wavelengths. Uh, let's now look at the role of the photo detector. So here we see a photo detector, which uh, is connected to what we call front end electronics. On the left hand side, we see uh, some pulses of light illuminating the photo detector. The role of the photo detector and electronics uh, is to convert that light signal into electrical signal shown on the right hand side. If we had perfect conversion, then on the right hand side, the electrical pulses would completely mirror or mimic uh, the light pulses. As we'll see later, that's almost never the case. Uh, there is no such a thing as perfect conversion of light pulses into electrical pulses. Now, most of photo detectors are going to operate in the mode where the output from the photo detector is current. However, most of electronics is geared in such a way that we manipulate voltages. So essential step in uh, photo detection is to convert current to voltage. The easiest way to do that is to use a resistor as shown on the left-hand side of this slide. Uh, there are some positive attributes of using resistor. It's a simple, inexpensive circuit, uh, well-behaved frequency response, well-understood noise. However, there are some cons, and one of them is that a, a resistor will tend to load a photo detector, perhaps leading to nonlinearity. Another possibility, which is much more common in the practical situations, is to use a trans impedance uh, amplifier. Uh, one great advantage of this amplifier is the existence of so-called virtual ground, uh, as indicated in the drawing. Because of this virtual ground, there is no loading of the photo detector, which improves linearity. However, there are some cons. One of them is that Transimpedance amplifier has complex noise and frequency response. It's a complex circuit, and it also needs biasing. So there has to be a source of a power voltage source uh, powering or biasing the transimpedance amplifier, which adds to complexity and cost.
Here we have a typ typical uh, setup in flow cytometry. So there is a, a photo detector, transimpedance amplifier. Then we have electronics, uh, which is uh, whose purpose is to measure some aspect of uh, the resulting voltage poles. It could be area, it could be amplitude, it could be duration, and some or some combination of these. That measured quantity, again expressed still as a, a voltage signal, is then input to A to D converter, which converts uh, uh, electrical signal into a stream of numbers, which are then fed into a computer uh, where one can then display uh, the resulting uh, data and infer some scientific information. So again, uh, what's measured? Well, there are a number of possibilities. One could measure the area under the curve or under the, uh, under the curve. You could measure a peak value or uh, its width or maybe all or some combination of these quantities. Uh, what they are will depend on the specific uh, situation in uh, flow cytometry research. So one, once the measurements are made, one can, for example, make a plot, scatter plots are uh, ubiquitous to uh, flow cytometry. Uh, on this slide, we see on the left-hand side, one could, for example, plot, let's say, forward scatter signal versus side scatter signal. It could be uh, amplitude of the poles in forward versus, say, amplitude of the poles uh, in the side scatter. So each point uh, in the scatter plot represents a single measurement of a single, uh, of a single cell. Uh, one could uh, plot, say, fluorescence in channel one versus fluorescence in channel two, or many other possible cross plots. So, okay, so when one makes these plots, and say if I have cells of uh, distinct properties, maybe three types of cells, then the points will tend to cluster as indicated on the left-hand side. It is from these uh, clusterings that one can infer uh, scientific information. However, one should realize that there is no such a thing in science as measurement without uh, error. And so technically each point here has some error bars associated with this, with this measurement. They're not shown, but the question is, are these error bars big, small? Uh, there could also be some systematic shifts uh, due to systematic errors. So uh, these plots don't only show scientific information but there is some degree of, let's say, misinformation. Uh, this information comes first together with light. However, also the detection system uh, can introduce uh, such misinformation. And so the purpose of this webinar, I know it's slide 22, what's the purpose? So the purpose of this webinar is to discuss uh, some properties of photo detectors that can introduce and, and the front end electronics that can introduce uh, error bars to these points and also can shift systematically points in various directions. Apart from uh, scatter plots, uh, a flow cytometrist can also produce a histogram, say, of a single quantity. Um, so on the x axis, we have uh, could be amplitude in the forward scatter, for example, and on the y axis, we have a uh, number of events. And so again, as mentioned before, these error bars or these uh, bars or this histogram contains errors. So first, let's discuss uh, briefly uh, photo detectors that are used in the uh, flow cytometry. So from the top, uh, we see a photomultiplier tube, avalanche uh, photodiode on the right, then below we have photodiode and uh, silicon photomultiplier. A brief introduction to uh, each one of them. So photomultiplier tube is a cold vacuum tube. Uh, it contains uh, three, four essential elements. Uh, the first one on the left-hand side and labeled with letter K uh, is a photocathode. A photocathode is that part of PMT where light, so the, the energy uh, that comes with light uh, is converted to electrical energy in the form of photoemitted electrons from the photocathode. So this is again, uh, basically the heart of the PMT. That's where the conversion occurs. The next essential element or elements are 
uh, dinodes, a sequence of dinodes, all these dinodes and photocathodes are biased with electrical potential in such a way that electric field is created uh, between these elements, which propels electrons in the forward direction, i.e. closer to uh, the anode, the third essential component. So when the photoelectron produced at the photocathode strikes the first dinode, it strikes the dinode with enough energy uh, to produce uh, some number of secondary electrons, three, four, five. This uh, multiplication of electrons is the gain mechanism uh, in a PMT. Uh, the process is repeated a number of times equal to number of dinodes. And thus, at the end, when the electrons are collected by the anode, instead of having, let's say, one electron, I could have, let's say, a million or so, we would say in this case that the gain of the PMT uh, is uh, one million. Now, the typical gains of PMTs actually can vary. Uh, I can, even for a given PMT, I can change the gain uh, by varying the bias voltage. And the range of the gains uh, is from about 10 to 5 to about 10 to 7. Uh, but more and less gains are possible as well. So PMT has intrinsic gain. And we'll so shortly see the importance of the intrinsic gain. Uh, the other three photodetectors are or belong to the same family. What uh, unites them is the existence of PN junction. On the left, we see a photodiode. A photon comes in and creates electron hole pair in the part of the pho uh, photodiode known as depletion region. The intrinsic electric field separates the two charges, uh, leading to formation of current. In case of a photodiode, one photon can create only one electron hole pair. And so the gain is one. So photodiodes have no intrinsic gain. However, if the electric field in the depletion region is high enough, a charge multiplication can occur. This occurs in avalanche photodiode, which means that one photon will, can result in number of electron hole pairs. For typical APDs, that gain, useful gain, is up to about 100 or so. In case of silicon photomultiplier, this device is an array of uh, avalanche photodiodes that operate in so-called uh, Geiger mode. A Geiger mode is a mode where once initiated, the avalanche does not stop on itself, does not quench on itself. It needs uh, some external quenching. So in case of SIPM, that external quenching to APD is provided by what we call quench resistor, which is shown in the, these, by these red blocks uh, in this cartoon depiction of SIPM. In case of SIPM, the gain that one obtains can be as high as 10 to 5, 10 to 6 or so, comparable to the gain in a, in a PMT. So what are some of the desired characteristics of photodetectors? Probably the most fundamental one is uh, photosensitivity. In other words, suppose I have uh, two pulses of light. Uh, one pulse is, say, composed of, quote unquote, blue photons. And the other one, much weaker, uh, is composed by, uh, say, red photons. Can the photodetector and front-end electronics detect these two pulses? Well, in this cartoon depiction, the first pulse was detected, whereas the second, not much. Uh, all we see is kind of some sort of noisy uh, wiggles. So what determines whether a pulse is detected or not? Well, there are two things. So one thing that very important to realize is that whether pulse detected or not is not only a function of photodetector, but also of front end electronics. One should think of these two as a system, as a unit, which can or cannot detect a pulse. So the important quantities in case of photodetector uh, would be photosensitivity and uh, also the intrinsic uh, gain of the photodetector. So uh, the points I made are important, which are repeated on this slide, and so I'm not going to read them since I've said them uh, already. So let's just look at uh, information that uh, a 
a manufacturer of photo detectors would provide a user. So on the left-hand side, we see a plot of uh, quantum efficiency uh, as a function of wavelength. Uh, quantum efficiency represents a, a probability that incident photon uh, is detected. Uh, for all photo detectors, uh, quantum efficiency will be uh, a function of wavelength, and this is a piece of information that will always be provided. A somewhat related quantity uh, to quantum efficiency is spectral sensitivity, which can also be provided. And the two quantities uh, are related to each other by the equations shown below. In other words, if I know quantum efficiency, I can deduce uh, spectral sensitivity and vice versa. Though I should say that this equation is only valid for uh, monochromatic uh, light. So suppose I have uh, a light signal on the left here that has certain uh, peak uh, power. Again, an ideal photo detector would produce a current uh, uh, output, current pulse, uh, with some peak uh, current. And so one can show that that peak current would equal to uh, maximum uh, light power uh, times uh, spectral sensitivity times intrinsic gain. So on the right-hand side of the equation is the value of the peak current. This is almost correct, I should say. This derivation here, or this calculation, assumes uh, that we have a lot of bandwidth in our detection, which may or, not be, may, may or may not be the case. But for now, let's not worry at the bandwidth. We'll worry about it uh, a few slides down the road. So now let's look at the importance of the, of the intrinsic gain. So if I have a photo detector uh, with intrinsic gain, say gain uh, equal to mu, then one photon is going to lead to a mu number of electrons, maybe say one million. And then I do conversion of that current pulse uh, to uh, a voltage pulse, say using a resistor. And then I have some output voltage. Now there is no such a thing as noise-free uh, measurement, so there will be some noise. And so if I now take the output signal and divide by the amount of noise I have in the system, I'm going to obtain certain signal-to-noise ratio uh, shown schematically on the right-hand side with big font. Now, is this situation similar to the one depicted below, where I have photo detector without the gain? So one photon creates one electron, then I have amplifier, voltage to voltage amplifier, which amplifies the voltage signal produced by the resistor. Do I get the same signal to noise ratio here? And the answer is no. Are you wondering, mm, how come? Well, we'll understand that a little bit later in this webinar. But right now, I'll just say that uh, the resistor here certainly is going to introduce noise. Now, if the photo detector has a lot of gain, that noise will not count very much. It won't be as relevant as in the case depicted below. That will be the main difference. So the intrinsic gain of the photo detector uh, makes uh, front end electronic noise uh, less relevant. Okay, so what are some other characteristics of photo detector? Well, one is that every photo detector is going to uh, create some output uh, current or voltage, but typically current, even in absence of light. If there is a light, still that uh, dark current uh, flows. Now, the amount of dark current uh, is typically a function of biasing, uh, voltage biasing on the photo detector and also temperature. Another important property of photo detector and front electronics together, and here this is especially true, uh, is the overall bandwidth. So suppose on left-hand side I have light pulses, which are close in time together. Also we have a pulse, the third one here, uh, most of the left, which has some structure. Let's assume that this structure is real, that this pulse is kind of double peaked. And these two peaks carry some scientific information. When I convert these pulses to electrical signal, ideally, 
I would have uh, enough fidelity uh, to see those pulses uh, distinctly. That amount of fidelity will depend on bandwidth. So if I do not have enough bandwidth, uh, what I may get, as shown on the right hand side, are pulses that overlap and uh, a pulse where the structure uh, is no longer resolved. So the often important question to ask is, do I have uh, enough bandwidth in my system? And uh, how much bandwidth do I need? Is uh, a lot of bandwidth, is infinite amount of bandwidth uh, good? Mm, not necessarily. Uh, before I answer some of these questions, uh, let's uh, look at uh, time signals in, from another angle. Uh, the angle is the Fourier representation. Let's look at the top of the slide. I have electrical signal, which is represented by some sinusoidal variation, say voltage or current. By a process known as Fourier transformation, I can represent the signal in what we call frequency space. Because this is a pure sinusoid, in that frequency space representation, I would have a single frequency shown by the red arrow uh, that has some amount of uh, power or weight. And suppose I have some other signal as a function of time, not necessarily sinusoid. The question is, can I represent this signal in a frequency space, i.e. does Fourier representation apply uh, to, let's say, non-sinusoidal uh, pulses or signals? And the answer is yes. And then they do not even have to be periodic. So in frequency space, uh, that pulse may be represented by some number of frequencies, i.e. some number of uh, sinusoids that together uh, are going to, when mixed together, are going to give me uh, the actual uh, signal uh, in time. And please note that these different sinusoids of different frequencies have different weights as represented by different heights of the arrows. Now what about if I have completely random signal, maybe one that we call white noise? Can I have Fourier representation? The answer is yes, and if it's really a white noise, then the Fourier representation would consist of wave, uh, frequencies varying from zero to infinity with the same uh, weights. So what does it all mean? Well, first, Let's look at this situation. Suppose I have uh, input uh, light, uh, which is uh, modulated maybe in sinusoidal, sinusoidal fashion. That light is detected by the photodetector and the resistor, and I get some voltage at the output as a function of frequency. If I were to vary the uh, frequency and take a ratio of uh, V as a function of omega versus a DC value of the voltage, and make the plot, I might get the plot as shown on the right-hand side of this slide. When the ratio falls or becomes one over square root, uh, the frequency range from zero to that point would be what we call bandwidth for this detection system. This will be a low example of low pass. This is the simplest possible situation. That bandwidth, the width, will depend uh, on the value of the resistor and on properties of the photodetector, like for example, its output uh, capacitance and the output uh, uh, resistance. So uh, the important point here is that both photodetector and detection electronics represented by the resistor determine the amount of bandwidth. So what about flow cytometry? You know, how can I determine the bandwidth? Uh, how much do I need? Well, if you look at the pulses in flow cytometry, they are kind of looking like Gaussian. So let's assume that I have a Gaussian pulse uh, in time that has a width uh, shown by delta t. So that's the full width half max duration of the pulse. If I perform Fourier transform, Fourier transform of Gaussian is also a Gaussian uh, with now frequency width uh, delta omega. One can show that uh, the width in time times the width in uh, frequency for Gaussian pulses is about equal to, uh, to three. And so how much bandwidth one really needs uh, will de 
will depend on how on the duration of the light pulses that one detects. But that duration will, for example, depend on the speed with which cells are being interrogated in the system. Now you may say, well, okay, so let's say that bandwidth comes to be, let's say, 100 megahertz. What about if I put, uh, you know, 800 megahertz? Will things be better? Not necessarily. Uh, as we'll see very shortly, uh, the bandwidth also determines the amount of noise that exists in our system. So that's not shown schematically uh, with this slide. I have very good fidelity. I can clearly resolve the light pulses, but the thick line here shows uh, that these pulses are more noisy. And here we see some uh, results of the simulation. On the left hand side, uh, the dashed line represents two pulses of light, and the solid line represents the electrical resulting signal and the amount of bandwidth is 100 megahertz. And we can see that the electrical pulses uh, kind of merge together. So there isn't enough resolution or fidelity in the detection system. On the right-hand side, we've increased the bandwidth. And so one resolves the pulses now, so much better fidelity. However, please note how much noisier the output signal is. So I guess the message here is that one has to be smart about how much bandwidth uh, one implements in the detection system. Let's now de discuss photo detection, the process of photo detection. So the basic setup is as follows. We have light coming from the left, photo detector, and the role of the resistor here is to convert uh, current to um, voltage. So my subsequent discussion will concentrate on signal to noise ratio at this uh, point. As we'll see shortly, that signal to noise ratio is going to be affected by basically three factors. One is the amount of light, two properties of the photo detector, and three uh, the properties of detection electronics. I've mentioned the word noise several times already, so now it's time to discuss some basic sources of noise. And please note that uh, this noise, again, is going to translate into uncertainty uh, in the points in uh, the scatter plots so common in flow cytometry. Let's begin by what we call uh, excess or uh, noise due to gain. Here we have a photo detector uh, that has some gain mechanism. In other words, single electron here is multiplied to some number output number, say mu, which would be then representative of the gain. So suppose I put in some signal with a signal to noise ratio, S N N, and what I get out is S N out. One could be tempted to say that S N out is larger, better than S N N, but actually the contrary is true. Uh, the gain uh, is actually going to reduce uh, the signal to noise for this particular element uh, in the detection chain. Why? And that's because the gain, the process of gain is a random process, uh, which means that say in the first shot, I have a gain of let's say 1000, the next one could be 1050, next time 950. So there is a gain variation. And that gain variation uh, leads to noise. That noise is represented by letter F, we call it excess noise factor, uh, which is defined as the ratio of signal to noise in to signal to noise out. All photo detectors that have intrinsic gain uh, will have this uh, source of noise. Uh, the second source is uh, dark current. So if I have some dark current with some mean value, that mean value can be subtracted of. So it's electronically possible to take the mean out. What you cannot take out uh, is the variation around that mean. And one can show that the variance, which is a square of uh, standard deviation, uh, is given by this relationship, 2E, where E is the fundamental charge, B is the bandwidth, F is the excess noise, mu is uh, gain, and ID is the mean value of dark current. 
uh, we call this noise uh, dark current shot noise. So every photo detector is going to have uh, this noise present. Uh, very early in this presentation, I also said that noise comes with light itself, as shown here. So suppose I have incoming photons that carry information, but they also carry uh, some degree of misinformation or noise. So even if this light were DC, I would have some mean value, but due to, again, randomness of photon emission, uh, there will be a variation around the mean value. That variation is noise. And the relationship for uh, the variance is very similar to what we saw in case of a dark current. So this is another example of white noise, and we refer to it as photon shot noise. There's one more noise uh, to discuss. Uh, this one is known as Johnson thermal noise. Suppose I have a resistor, uh, which is unbiased, but if it's biased, it doesn't matter. I would find that there is a you know, random fluctuation of current in the, in the wire depicted. The mean value of that current will be equal to zero, but the variance is not equal to zero. And it's given by uh, this relationship, uh, 4K TB over R, where K is Boltzmann constant, T is temperature, and R is the value of the resistor. Even the perfectly made manufactured resistor is going to have uh, this Johnson noise. Now, given now the signal and noise, uh, we construct a quantity known as signal to noise ratio. Uh, this is a figure of merit, which determines uh, how trustworthy uh, one's measurement is. So if signal-to-noise ratio is less than one, then one is measuring nothing. Uh, it's just, <laughs> you know, well, you're buried by, by amount of noise. Uh, signal-to-noise ratio must be larger than one for quality of the detected information to improve, and higher this ratio is, higher the quality. Let's look at this uh, relationship a little bit more closely. So in the numerator, I have a signal. So that's light power of the pulse, spectral sensitivity, uh, intrinsic gain. In denominator, I have a sum in quadrature of the relevant noises. And so 2EB uh, P S lambda times F mu squared, uh, this is the photon shot noise. In addition to what I like to call science photons, I could also have photons due to background. And so that would also contribute uh, shot noise. Another contribution of shot noise is due to their current represented by uh, this ID term. And finally, I have uh, uh, noise due to resistive termination, the Johnson noise. If I did not have resistive termination, but instead a uh, transimpedance amplifier, then this term uh, would represent the noise of the transimpedance amplifier, which is much harder to characterize. So as stated already, for detection to be to bear valuable scientific information, that signal to noise ratio uh, should be a larger than one. Again, larger it is, better it is. So first, uh, let me uh, show you, using this equation, the importance of intrinsic gain. So suppose that intrinsic gain is very large, so mu is very large. If that's the case, then shot noises uh, due to photon background and dark current can be much, much, much larger than Johnson noise due to the resistor. And so I can simply drop uh, that term, the Johnson noise due to the resistor. If I do so, uh, then, as you can see in the equation below, the mu cancels out. So intrinsic gain makes electronics noise uh, less relevant. Uh, please note, however, that F does not drop out. F is the penalty that we have for uh, having uh, gain. And so this slide summarizes what I just said already. However, there's one subtle point. One point is that well, this term, the Johnson noise, can also be made small by having uh, uh, large resistive termination. 
So you could say, well, instead of having, let's say, 10 kilo ohm resistor, why not put you know, 10 mega ohm and I can make that term uh, small? The answer is yes, you could make it small. However, when the resistor is that large, you'll start to load in adverse way of the photodetector. The photodetector is very likely to develop nonlinearities. And also, you're going to limit uh, the dynamic, I'm sorry, the, uh, the bandwidth. And so, so typically, you know, making this lar uh, R arbitrarily large is not possible in uh, real applications. So as stated before, gain, interesting gain is very useful, of course, especially useful when one deals with the weak light sig signals, but it comes with a noise penalty expressed by excess noise factor. And so below we see typical values of F for the three photodetectors with gain. In case of a PMT, F is about 1.2 or so. Please note that ideally F would be one, which means no penalty. In case of a PMT, that excess noise is approximately equal to delta divided by delta minus one, where delta is the gain of the first dynode. In case of APD, uh, F is about three, four, much larger than for a PMT. And it is approximately given by gain to a 0.3 power. So in case of APD, excess noise actually increases uh, with uh, with the gain, and this is why I said earlier in the presentation that the useful gain of APD is somewhere between, oh, up to about 100 or so. If you go to 300 or 400 gain, then F is going to uh, increase appropriately. Now, in case of SIPM, the excess noise is about 1.1 or so, so amazingly low. And it depends primarily on the process, which I did not discuss in this presentation, which is the crosstalk, uh, whose uh, typical values now are uh, less than 10%. So silicon photomultiplier has very high gain and also small penalty for that gain. This is why there is a great interest in flow cytometry community to use, if possible, uh, silicon photomultipliers as the photodetectors in the site scatter chain. Uh, in what follows, I'm going to um, uh, briefly discuss a comparison between uh, four uh, photodetectors, which are going to be equally terminated by a 10 kilo ohm resistor. And the comparison is going to show signal to noise as a function of a power, incident power, and uh, wavelength. I am not allowed to reveal the uh, part, part numbers. However, uh, all four photodetectors are commonly used in flow cytometry. So here is the PMT, and below are uh, specifications of this PMT. Uh, here is APD, again, with the relevant specifications uh, at the bottom. Uh, photodiode, again, with the specifications and the silicon photomultiplier. As stated, all are loaded with a 10 kilo ohm resistor where we convert a current uh, to voltage. I've used the relationship uh, for signal to noise ratio discussed already and produced uh, this plot uh, where on y axis we have log of signal to noise times square root of the bandwidth so the bandwidth here is a variable that is not specified. And on the x-axis, we have a log of incident power. I've used 560 nanometer light. And uh, this is the order of signal to noise ratio. So at very low light levels, uh, PMT outperforms silicon photomultiplier, which outperforms APD, which outperforms uh, photodiode. This is primarily due to uh, the gain. However, as uh, power increases, we can see that the performance of PMT and SIPM uh, slowly converges. And at even higher powers, the performance of APD, PMT and SIP converge. And then at even higher powers, all four detectors uh, produce a similar uh, signal to noise ratio. Here we see a plot of uh, signal to noise. 
now versus the wavelength. Again, for certain wavelengths, uh, say somewhere be between 400 and 700, uh, again, PMT, SIPM, APD, and PMT is the order of in which signal-to-noise ratios are. However, one can see that when wavelength increases somewhere between 700, the signal-to-noise of PMT uh, drops dr dramatically. This is due to PMTs, this PMTs, uh, very low spectral sensitivity at wavelengths higher than about 700 or so. However, at this point, I'd like to note something, is that the spectral sensitivity of a PMT is determined by the type of photocathode material uh, it has. And there are a variety of photocathode materials. Uh, there's not just one photocathode. And so here is the plot of spectral sensitivities as a function of wavelength uh, for a number of PMTs. And we can see that for the family of PMTs, uh, there is a coverage of wavelengths uh, from about 300, actually even less, from UV uh, to uh, infra, infrared. Now, here is another plot. So in this case, again, we have a 10 kilo ohm termination, but here uh, the incident power is uh, one nanowatts, so much larger than, than before. And we can see that in this regime, there is no discernible uh, difference in the performance of PMT, SIPM, and APD. So the message is that if you have enough light or plenty of light, then the gain is no longer as critical as in the case when the amount of light, incident light, is small. Now, one question to ask is, what is the, you know, the best possible signal-to-noise ratio one can get? The answer is, uh, this limit is known as uh, uh, signal shot noise limited case. It occurs where, again, the noise due to the front electronics is negligible, so 4KTB over R is negligible. Dark current shot noise is negligible, and the background uh, shot noise is negligible. So if these terms drop out, the equation at the bottom shows the signal-to-noise ratio in this photon shot noise limited case. This is the best one can get uh, for a given bandwidth, F, and spectral sensitivity. If I would like to increase the signal-to-noise, I have a number of choices. I can increase the incident power, uh, have better spectral sensitivity, or and or reduce bandwidth if possible. It may not be possible because, again, of the fidelity issues. Uh, before I move on, I would like to make uh, actually one comment about this comparison. It's kind of getting late in this um, webinar. And the comment which could be sort of misunderstood, uh, but let me make it anyway, is that this comparison is not exactly the most fair comparison. What do I mean by this? What I mean is that phototector alone, again, uh, cannot operate. It's useless. You have to have front-end electronics. However, a front-end electronic that is optimal, let's say, for photodetector, may not be optimal for, say, PMT. Uh, because again, PMT and photodiode are distinct devices with uh, very distinct properties. And so to make this comparison really, really the most fair, I should have front-end electronics that is optimal for a given photodetector. So I hope that uh, this clarifies uh, this very subtle and important point. So 10 kilo ohm resistor may not actually be optimal for, for it for none of these photodetectors. But again, what is optimal will be uh, different uh, for them. So uh, let me say it differently, since this is kind of uh, uh, a point that is uh, often discussed in the flow cytometry community. Uh, can APD uh, do as well as PMT? The answer is yes, it can. But in that case, because APD has much lower gain, you have to have electronics that has very, very, very low noise. In fact, if electronics has no noise, uh, then the gain doesn't matter anymore. And the higher spectral sensitivity of APD will make it a better photodetector. So again, it's not just photodetector. It's the electronics that plays a role. Uh, let's very quickly discuss some other desired uh, characteristics of photodetectors. Uh, one of them is linearity and dynamic range. 
linearity is uh, represents the relationship between uh, output and input. If I change input, then output should change uh, proportionally uh, if the forward or if the detection if the detection system is linear. And dynamic range is a measure of range of signals I can I can measure from lowest uh, to highest. So let's have a closer look at these uh, uh, characteristics. So linearity and dynamic range are often related to each other, as this plot represents. Uh, this is output in some arbitrary units versus input. For ideal response, I would I would have uh, well, ideal response would be represented by this red dashed line. So wherever the input is, the output uh, follows. However, because of the presence of dark current and because of the fact that every photodetector will saturate at high enough input light level, the actual response from the photodetector uh, is shown by the black curve. And one could define uh, uh, one can define one can define dynamic range as the range of input light levels for which one gets uh, signal to noise uh, greater uh, than one may be represented by the vertical double-headed arrow. Uh, here is a plot that shows uh, deviation from linearity uh, for a PMT, which is illuminated by uh, pulses uh, of 0.5 microsecond uh, uh, duration. And she said, what? Well, there are two curves. How come there are two curves? I thought it's the same PMT. Well, there are two curves because it turns out that for PMT, uh, the linearity and dynamic range is actually a function of uh, the divider circuit. So in case of PMT, I can change you know, the degree of linearity and the dynamic range uh, by uh, changing the voltage or changing the divider circuit. Uh, for the red point where the uh, linearity, uh, the deviation from linearity is 10%, uh, it would take about uh, 4.2 photons per pulse to achieve that nonlinearity. For comparison, uh, here is a, a closer look uh, for at dynamic range for silicon photomultiplier. Uh, the equation at the top shows number of fired microcells as a function of duration of the uh, of the pulse uh, photon detection efficiency and the number of photons uh, in the pulse. And so, using the number of photons from the previous slide would see that this SIPM would actually have a 32% deviation from ideal response. So in this particular example, uh, dynamic range of SIPM uh, is uh, somewhat worse than in case of the PMT. Now, how can I improve dynamic range of SIPM? And that will be by changing the number of um, microcells. If I increase the number of microcells, I improve of the dynamic range. However, uh, the trade-off is that photon detection efficiency is going to uh, decrease. And very quick note, when one uses SIPM as photo detector, one should not focus light on SIPM. It has to be defocused. If you focus the light, you're actually reducing its dynamic range. Now, very quickly, in case of uh, photodiode and, um, and APD, the lower level of dynamic range is limited by uh, the amount of dark current, and the upper level, uh, which is very high, uh, will be typically limited by uh, the electronics. So it's the biasing and especially the load resistor that is going to affect uh, the upper level. Typically, the upper level is much higher than in case of PMT and SIPM. So we are almost uh, at the end of this presentation. Uh, I know it's been quite, quite long and convoluted, and you may be wondering, so what? What does it all mean? And where, what's the implication? Well, the implication is that all these quote-unquote imperfections in the detection system, uh, you know, the limited bandwidth, uh, the existence of various uh, noises, uh, will introduce uncertainties in the scatter plots. And so here is a, a sequence of plots that come from a simulation, realistic simulation, where with each plot, I'm going to introduce a distinct uh, uncertainty. So on the left at the top, we start with ideal uh, situation, ideal 
a detection de uh, depicted by three points that have no scatter. So everything is perfect. And then we go to the right. So the first uncertainty uh, is due to sample and optics variations. So again, the cell may not be able to pass exactly through the center of the interrogation point. So the amount of light scattered by cell is going to vary, will depend on its actual path. And so we are going to introduce widths or scatter into the point. The next one, we introduce photon shot noise, uh, which uh, increases the amount of scatter. Then we have uh, a quantum uh, conversion uncertainty, gain variation. And finally, we add uh, random electronic noise. And so what is, by the way, the simulation does not have uh, bandwidth, but bandwidth will add additional uncertainties uh, and perhaps even systematic shifts. So the important point is, this is ideal and this is realistic. And so how much of that scatter here is really due to cell properties and how much is it due to photo detection system? It is very important for users to uh, be able to estimate how much of each uh, is present. And this may or may not be easy in practical life. And perhaps this is why we have this uh, webinar. So uh, we are finally at the end of this uh, uh, presentation. So very quickly, some parting remarks, which probably I failed to state that flow cytometry is a very versatile technique to study cells and microparticles. It's used in medicine, biology, engineering, and many other fields. Phototector is, in, is an indispensable component of every flow cytometer. So every flow cytometer will have at least two, and uh, practically much, much more than two photodetectors. But the choice of photodetector should be based on the best signal-to-noise performance of the detection system not just photodetector, but photodetector coupled with uh, front end electronics. Now, limitation of detection systems. Again, the amount of noise that introduces, the amount of systematic uh, shifts that introduces will affect scatter plots and histograms, masking and perhaps distorting uh, the actual science. And finally, idiosyncrasies of photodetectors prevent a simple swap of one detector for other without altering the rest of the detection system. So what it means is that if I have a PMT and mm, I don't like PMT, let me just pull it out and put say SIPM instead, but I don't change anything else, that will almost certainly not work. Again, a photo detector uh, is part of a uh, detection system, uh, it has an intimate relationship with front end electronics. And so simple swap probably will not work. I would like to thank everyone for listening uh, to this webinar. It was my great pleasure. And um, until next time, thank you again. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Pytek. So questions from our audience are, when discussing the effect of bandwidth on signal fidelity, is the bandwidth meant to be 100 kilohertz instead of 100 megahertz? Oh, yes, I I think I misspoke on that slide. Uh, I mean, when I was uh, referring to the slide, uh, I uh, mentioned the incorrect bandwidth, but the correct bandwidth is written on the slide. <clears throat> thank you. So it was 100 megahertz. All right, thank you. I'm sorry, yeah. Does the size of the photo detection area affect the signal to noise, and what are the key considerations when choosing the physical dimensions? This is actually quite a deep topic. Uh, so the size of the photo detector can have significant effect on the photo detector's uh, performance. So let's uh, briefly talk about, uh, say, photodiodes. Uh, so by increasing the size, I'm going to increase capacitance, and I'm also going to increase the amount of dark current. And so higher capacitor will affect uh, the bandwidth of the detection. Uh, and, uh, and the bandwidth, of course, also uh, uh, affects the fidelity of the signal. Now, um, now whether, what size I choose will depend whether I want or do not want to focus the light on the photodetector. 
in case of PMT, APD and PMT, uh, one should focus the light uh, to, to a point. However, in case of SIPM, one should not, since focusing the light on SIPM will lead to uh, a lower uh, uh, dynamic range. Thank you. What are the effects on temper? Uh, sorry. What are the effects of temperature on the different types of photodetectors and considerations that should be addressed in FCM? So yes, uh, temperature does have effect. The primary effect is uh, a dark current, uh, which for all photodetectors is actually a strong function of temperature. Now, if I were to say measure just one cell at a time, you know, the temperature doesn't really play a role. But if I run a flow cytometer. Uh, for you know, uh, minutes or hours or, or, or you know, a good fraction of a day, uh, then uh, perhaps absolute temperature is not as critical as temperature uh, stability. Uh, if temperature changes, uh, then for example, and if it's uncompensated, uh, then uh, gain, for example, of SIPM is uh, going to change. Um, uh, and dark currents are going to change, so we do not have repeatability uh, in, our, in our measurements. Thank you. Do the solid state devices have different spectral curves similar to the PMTs? So uh, most of the uh, solid state devices used in flow cytometry uh, use silicon. However, if I were to say compare uh, spectral curves for two uh, silicon photodiodes, they might differ. So for example, peak sensitivity may be a different wavelength, and that is uh, typically achieved by a proper sandwiching or proper ar or a certain architecture uh, of the of the photodetector. However, uh, uh, silicon is not the only semiconductor used. We can also use, for example, uh, indium gallium arsenide or other semiconductors uh, which have uh, sensitivities in different parts of electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, the ones I've mentioned uh, would have uh, sensitivity in IR, where silicon uh, photodetectors uh, do not. Thank you. One of the questions from the audience was, is that do cooling solid state detectors improve the signal noise ratio significantly? Uh, I'm not sure about significantly, but uh, uh, yes. Uh, so uh, what cooling does is to reduce the amount of dark current, which then reduces the amount of uh, dark current uh, shot noise. Um, so uh, however, you know, uh, cooling itself is not easy and if it's not necessary, I would not advise it. Uh, cooling is you know, expensive uh, uh, to run and uh, expensive to, uh, to uh, organize in some sense. So if one can, can get away um, from cooling, uh, one should, but uh, again, temperature stabilization is probably more, more relevant than what the absolute temperature is. Concerning some of the products that are available today, if you had, what, can you speak on some of the differences between a PMT-based system versus a APD-based system and what those are? Yes, so uh, yes, I'm aware of uh, uh, the, uh, a dialogue in the uh, flow cytometry community, uh, whether you know, one can uh, achieve similar performance with APDs uh, versus uh, PMTs. And so as I discussed in my webinar, uh, if one has uh, a plenty of light, uh, then the high gain of a photodetector uh, does not matter. That's one. Uh, and so yes, one could then use uh, APD uh, instead of PMT. Uh, moreover, uh, if we have uh, front-end electronics that has no noise, and such electronics does not exist, but there are some that have very low noise, though they are expensive, then again, uh, having very high gain that PMT offers uh, may, not be, may not be necessary. So. Uh, so, uh, you know, these are, this is uh, basically this is the point. However, if I don't want to invest in uh, very low noise front end electronics, uh, then gain uh, certainly of the photodetector helps in the detection. I am com completely aware of pro and cons uh, between APD and uh, PMT, uh, especially PMTs, uh, but uh, there are situations where PMT simply uh, is giving uh, a better performance, all else being uh, the same. Thank you. The CVs with APDs tend to be less than those containing PMTs. Um, it seems that these are sometimes preferred for most flow applications. Is this a correct assumption, or would you I, disagree with that? No, I prefer 
I would prefer not to answer this question. I don't want to comment about specific uh, systems uh, in specific labs. Uh, so uh, I, I probably would like to decline this question. <clears throat> no, that's fine. So that actually brings us to the end of our question and, uh, question and answer period now. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Pytech for his presentation today and his talk on photo detection and flow cytometry. Uh, for any questions that were not addressed in this session, a representative from Hamamatsu will be in contact concerning it, or you may reach out to them. This presentation was sponsored by Hamamatsu in partnership with Wiley's Current Protocols. This webinar will be available for on-demand viewing on the Current Protocols website at currentprotocols.com in the webinar section. Thank you for attending, and thank you, Dr. Pytech, for your presentation today. Thank you very much. Thank you.